Uh, the title of tonight's sermon is uh, Goldilocks or Lukewarm Christians. I'm always reminded of this in, in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, if you're there, look down at verse number 16. It says, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Uh, you know, the Goldilocks, the story of Goldilocks, this is a, a children's fairy tale that I'm sure most of us are familiar with. This is the girl Goldilocks that goes into the woods. She finds a house in the woods. It's a bear's house because it's a normal fairy tale, right? Uh, she goes in, she finds the beds, she tries out the beds, one's too firm, one's too soft, and the other one's just right. Then she finds uh, on the kitchen table there's some porridge, uh, and she tries the first one and it's too hot, and the other one's too cold, and then the last one is just right. And that really reminds me of this, chap this uh, verse in Revelation 3.16, Because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Uh, tonight I want to talk that we shouldn't be Goldilocks Christians. I want to give some examples of that, and I'm sure we can all think of people that we know, uh, uh, other churches that we've been to in the past, other people that we meet out that are saved. We can all think of people that might fit this category. But I want to also warn against how we can protect uh, ourselves from leaning towards this tendency and also those that we're leading towards falling towards this tendency of be becoming lukewarm or becoming uh, these Goldilocks Christians, right? And so I'm talking about, you know, people that... that uh, they're only going to serve the Lord. They're not going to serve the Lord when it's hot. They're not going to serve the Lord when it's too cold. They're going to do it when it's lukewarm, when it's comfortable, when it's easy for them to do it. Um, we shouldn't be like that, right? Uh, John 5 and verse 35, talking about John the Baptist, it says, He was a burning and a shining light. In Revelation 3.16, where it says, Neither cold nor hot, those are two pretty good extremes, right? When it's hot outside, it's not comfortable. When it's cold outside, it's not comfortable to be outside. God doesn't want us to get too comfortable in this Christian life. He wants us to be on fire for Him. He wants us to be, he wants us to be extreme in our Christian life as we're serving Him. Um, we can think of this kind of in the Goldilocks uh, Christian category as, as far as people that we know, maybe that are saved, well, of course, that are saved, but maybe they don't come to church very often, or they're going to a liberal church, or they're not involved in the things of God, or they'll go soul winning once in a while, but it's only when certain things line up and the stars align and everything just falls right into place, right? We should, be, we should be holding fast to what God tells us to do. We should be steadfast in those things, and we shouldn't be wishy-washy on that. Let me give some examples of how it might impact us in a, in a worldly sense, in our secular lives, in our work. Uh, we all know people at work that, that uh, they don't show up on time, right? A punctuality thing, that's something too. We say, we say you know, the boss says, hey, you're going to start at 6, and you show up at 6.10. That's not 6. That's not keeping our word. That's, that's a wishy-washy type uh, behavior. If you're not showing up on time, you're robbing time from your boss. You're robbing time from the people you say you're going to meet. And this is one that, I mean, you know, things happen, and we'll get into that later in the sermon. Life happens, but we should all strive to make sure that we are punctual. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 37, But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. If you say yes, do it. If you say no, that's, you know, let your word be the final authority. Um... It's becoming more and more common in the culture, and we see it at work, that people call in sick for any manner of reason, right? It can be, oh, I got a headache. I'm not feeling 100%. I'm not, I'm not on par with where I want to be, so I'm just going to take a day. I'm going to take a day, right? And with sick hours, and I think, I think legally, California, you have to have hours paid, sick time per year is, is the requirement. You know, so there is a coverage, right? You're still getting paid for staying home, but that still costs your boss something. That still costs the company something. Whoever you're working for, somebody had to pay for that. Somebody had to cover your, somebody at work, we were talking about it this morning with the guys in the back, somebody had to pick up your slack when, when somebody slacks off or when somebody doesn't hold up their end of the bargain. This is that lukewarm or this only doing it when it suits us uh, mentality in the secular life. There's no such thing as a free lunch if, in this example of somebody calling in sick. Somebody's depending on you at work or wherever it is that you're, that you're calling in sick to, somebody's depending on you at that point. Um, the Christian life, there, this can be examples too that can bleed over into this. And this was kind of one that um, uh, this past uh, fall and this past winter, I know, you know, it was kind of a lot of sicknesses and stuff going around. And like me with my family, and there was a period of like two or three weeks where like everybody in the house was sick, right? One, per, one kid got it, and then it just kind of spreads around. Everybody's sick. And then like a month later, same thing happened again, you know? So it was these two periods of time where everybody was having a cough, and and Sometimes I would debate in my mind, like, well, should I, you know, I don't want to spread it around. I don't want to give this to everybody else at church. So I kind of started looking through the Bible, and that's what I want to share with you this evening. That's the reason on this. Hebrews 10.25 is a verse we all know well. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, 
but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approach. The Bible here is talking about church attendance as something important that God commands us to be in church. Um, and oftentimes, like, like I was saying, culturally in, at the workplace, uh, it's becoming more and more common for people to call in sick. And when, I, when we were going through that with the family, that was kind of a thing in the back of my mind. You know, I don't want to, want to be spreading germs to everybody in church. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And I was kind of looking through this and, and, and reading the New Testament on this, and, and uh, I read these passages before, and it kind of stuck with me as kind of an odd thing um, culturally. But I think, especially after the whole pandemic, maybe people are a little bit oversensitive on the whole disease and germs and sickness and colds thing. Um, and, and again, I mean, this could probably fall into a Romans 14, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You know, every guy's going to have different standards slightly on this in his own, in his own household. But uh, reading through the Bible, this is, this is kind of interesting. Romans 16, look down at verse 16. As he's closing the chapter of Romans, Paul writes, Salute one another with an holy kiss. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 20 says, All the brethren greet you, greet ye one another with an holy kiss. It says the same thing about the holy kiss as a greeting or a salutation in 2 Corinthians, also in 1 Peter and 1 Thessalonians. So throughout the New Testament, you're seeing this as a common greeting, a warm greeting between brethren. And obviously, like, I don't want to, you know, this is not something I'm recommending we do in 2024 America today. It's not culturally appropriate here. But the point I'm trying to make is that they weren't worried about spreading germs in that close proximity with one another as they were greeting each other, right? Um, you know, culturally around, this is, this is something maybe you have family members or friends that are from different countries where this is a more accepted practice, the kiss on the cheek. Uh, my, uh, my wife has some family from Holland, and the first time we met him was when they flew out for our wedding. So they came to meet, and she has an uncle. Um, he's a big guy, six foot six, big guy. Um, he's actually since passed away, but big guy, big, like the happiest guy you've ever met. And then I, you know, stick out my hand to meet him. Hi, nice to meet you, Plone. And he grabs me by the shoulder and gives me a kiss on each cheek like four times. And, you know, you're kind of just not sure what to expect. That's not, not something we're used to in the culture. Uh, but for him, it was a completely cultural way to, uh, acceptable way to show a greeting, an affectionate greeting. Hey, good to meet you. Really good to meet you. And this is, this is the point that he's talking about in Romans 16 and all throughout the New Testament that, you know, they weren't overly concerned with this, you know, the common colds, the mild coughs, and different things that they would get. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter number 2. Obviously, there are some exceptions. And again, I believe Romans 14 is a good place for this. Let every man, every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But Philippians chapter 2 also shows us an example of somebody who, is, who was sent somewhere and wasn't able to make it. Philippians 2 and verse number 25, it says, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother. So he's writing to say that this guy is going to be sent, or was going to be sent to the Philippians, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because that he had heard, ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So it says in verse 27, for indeed he was sick nigh unto death. You know, he was saying in 25 that he was going to send this man of Epaphroditus to them, but he wasn't able to make it because he was sick nigh unto death. So obviously, you know, if you're sick to the point where you can't get out of bed, that's a different situation than, oh, I got a little tickle in my throat, or I got a slight headache, or my tummy's not quite feeling right, right? Um, and again, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, but I want, what I'm trying to get at with the whole idea of Goldilocks or lukewarm Christians is let's make sure we're not making excuses to get us out of church or to get us uh, to stay home or to not go soul winning. Because in that same example, when you go to work and you call in sick, somebody's counting on you, somebody else has to pick up the slack, or some things just don't get done at work when you call in sick. In the same way, if we don't go soul winning or if we don't go to church, people in your family or you don't hear certain things that you need to hear at the, at the church service, at the preaching. You don't go soul winning, people don't hear the gospel that need to hear it or hear, have that opportunity, right? People are depending on us. Um, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter uh, chapter number 5. Um, this is a, a verse kind of about pastors and what they're supposed to be, and I, I didn't... Uh, Asked pastor about this, but I hope this is okay. We, you know, we've been here since the church plant started five years ago. It'll be five years in September. Brother George, Miss Natalie, there's been a few of us since that time. In all those years, um, how many times do you think pastor was sick and missed church service because he was sick? 
Zero. Not a single time. And it's not because pastor hasn't gotten sick in the last five years, right? Things happen. Family gets sick. People get sick. Things happen. But I want to show that here in verse Peter 5 and verse number 1. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, notice this, but being in samples to the flock. Okay, the way, the qualifications for a pastor, the qualifications for a, for a bishop, you know, he's to be blameless, not given to wine, not given to filthy lucre, the husband of one wife, children in faithful subjection, right? All these qualifications that allow a man to be qualified for the position of a pastor, to be ordained. But how they live their life and those qualifications are to be examples to us and samples to us, right, as the flock. Um, that, that example of sickness and making sure that you're at church. The only time the pastor's ever missed church service was because he was cheap preaching at another church service somewhere else. Those are the only times that he's ever missed a church service. So I think we can take that as an example and apply that to our lives. Like, look, if you can't get out of bed, if you have a severe illness, you're down, you know, that's maybe an exception. Every, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, again. But let's make sure we're not making excuses, okay? Um, I will say this, though, that every time, like during these last couple months when my kids were sick, if I was like, you know, thinking in my mind, like, well, maybe, you know, they're, they're coughing a lot. I don't know, maybe we should stay home, maybe. Uh, and then decided just, nope, you know what, we're just going to go. Based on principle, we're going to go. This is our routine. This is what we do. We're just going to go anyway. Every single time that I've done that and gone, I've heard something that I needed to hear at church that day. Or my wife has heard something that she needed to hear at church service that day. So it, it's important. The devil wants nothing more than for us to get out of church, right? And I'm not saying this is just something, like I said, I'd gone over in the last... Uh, during the last year when everybody was sick, so I'm not, I'm not trying to call anybody out. I'm just saying this is what I've looked through the Bible, and okay, this is my standard. This is where I'm going to set my standard for me and my family. And obviously, you know, we need to understand um, some of these exceptions, right? It's coming up into the summer in Fresno, and it gets pretty hot, right? It gets 105 plus. It gets 110 two weeks ago. Two years ago, it was 115 for a couple days. My wife's going to be pregnant. There's other ladies that are going to be, you know, extremely pregnant far along in the church at that time, and if it's over 105, I'm not going to have my pregnant wife walking around in the middle of the afternoon soul winning. We want to be smart. That's not what I'm saying. Maybe go soul winning at a different time or something like that. But let's make sure we're not making excuses, right? That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, turn to Luke chapter 17, please. Luke chapter 17. Sometimes we think, um, you know, all the things we do, and especially when we go out soul winning and we talk to, we talk to people at the door and, and they say that they know they're going to heaven because they're a good person or because they're, you know, doing this and that and the other thing. And they, they've, they've qualified their level of Christian li living as just enough to get them into heaven, right? They're thinking it's works-based salvation. They're thinking they're going to make it just based on their qualifications alone. Um, and we know, as we're going out knocking the door, as we're reading the Bible, as we're coming to church, as we're doing all these things that we're supposed to be doing, we know there's a spectrum of people out there as far as uh, how, how ardent they live their Christian life, right? Some of them are living it full out, and they're still works save salvation. Some are you know, not doing hardly anything. But in their mind, that bar, wherever that bar is set, that's their bar they have to step over in order to be saved, right? As far as a works-based salvation mindset. That's what I'm trying to get at here. And oftentimes, we can see that in them, but sometimes we can apply that to ourselves in the works that we do uh, as far as knowing that we go out soul winning, knowing that we're reading our Bible, knowing that we're coming to church three to thrive, knowing that we're involved in church and we're involved in our, you know, reaching the lost in our community with the gospel. Sometimes we can think like, oh, I'm, I'm the above and beyond category of I'm doing quite a bit, you know, compared to the average bear, compared to the average Christian. And while that may be true, look down at Luke 17 and verse 7. In God's eyes, that is not the case. It says, But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he's come in from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I've eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things which were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done, notice this, all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. It's our duty to do, notice, all those things which are commanded you. 
You know, we're not being in the above and beyond category of Christians by doing all the things which are commanded us. That's what's our duty. That's what's expected of us. That's what's commanded us, right? That's the baseline. If we hit that, we're still not break even. We're still unprofitable servants. We're not extraordinarily profitable servants. We're, we're still at unprofitable servant level, right? So sometimes we can get that idea, you know, and, and well, it doesn't really matter if I miss a service or two because I come all the time. I, I'm pretty regular, this and that. All those things which are commanded you is what, what the bar is from God's standards, okay? Uh, again, God wants us to be cold or hot. He wants us to be on the extremes of that spectrum. He doesn't want us to be too comfortable in this Christian life. Again, because people are counting on us. Amen. So we shouldn't be lukewarm. We shouldn't have uh, these lukewarm attitudes towards church, towards our Christian life, towards the unsaved out there. Uh, but sometimes life happens. And that's what I want to talk about now. Sometimes life happens and life gets in the way. People do get sick. Cars do break down. You do lose a job once in a while. Things happen, right? And so how can we prevent or prepare for these issues so that we can prevent those things from sidetracking our Christian life or from getting us out of church? Uh, there's a, there's a, it was a book that I read. It, it talked about this thing in, um, in business called a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So it's a way that you can look at, it could be anything. It could be your own physical fitness. It could be uh, your personal finance. It could be a business. It could be a, a, a company. You could look at all these different things and analyze them based on their strengths. What are they good at? What are they doing well? What are some weaknesses that they have? What are some opportunities they have? And then what are some threats, you know? And if we apply that principle to our Christian life, we can kind of begin to prepare by looking at these areas. Okay, I'm doing pretty good at Bible reading. I'm doing pretty good at church attendance. But maybe I, maybe I don't go soul winning as much as I should. Maybe I'm not having my prayer time like I should. What are, an oper what are weaknesses or threats that could slow down our Christian life? I'll give you some, uh, some personal uh, examples. We live a little ways away, so we drive a little bit. Sometimes cars break down. It was about two years ago. We have two cars, and both cars broke down at the same time. What are we going to do? Well, we rented a car from a, neighbor, uh, from a family member that had a spare car so we could still get to church, right? You do what you can. You do what you have to in order to get to church. If you think about it as a husband uh, providing for his family, right? Do you go to work to provide for your family to make sure they have a roof over their heads and clothes to wear and food to eat in the pantry and all these things? Only when you're feeling well, only when it's convenient, only when everything's working well. No, you do it because you have to. You do it on principle, right? And that's how we should do in the Christian life as well. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like I said, you can, you can lose your job. Things happen. The economy goes up and down. Sometimes people get laid off. Sometimes things happen. Uh, making sure that you have a cushion or some type of a plan. And if you lose your job, hey, your new job is finding a job. Eight hours a day, go be looking for work. You know, don't just be take, sitting around taking it as a vacation. Be actively pursuing that job and that career. You need to provide for your family, especially as men. That's, that's a goal for us, right? A commandment for us. Um, so life happens. Make sure that we're preparing and seeing opportunities and heading against those opportunities happening. So on the vehicle aspect, make sure your car is well maintained. Make sure things are in order. Make sure you got something that's reliable. Uh, or make sure you got a backup or something like that. Um, if it's something with uh, work, work is a big one. Work can get in the way. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm self-employed, and so there's some people that depend on me, and the dairy runs 24-7. So we have people on the clock today. We have people on the clock Wednesday night. We have people on the clock on Christmas. It's part of the, part of the routine of things. If something happens and I get a phone call, instead of having to get drug away to church, that was a change that we made. Like, okay, look, we're going to organize the schedules so that somebody can be there so that somebody else can take that call if something needs to happen, right? We try and make it work so that work doesn't get in the way of your Christian life. Amen. We were talking about this again this morning. You know, a, a good job can be a blessing from the Lord, but if it's a good job that takes you away from church or takes you further away from uh, being in church or going soul winning or reading your Bible, it's, it's not from the Lord. It's something that's getting you out of the Christian life. Turn to, um, turn to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter number 6. You know, when things, when life happens and things start cutting into our church life or things start cutting into our Christian life, you have to do what it takes in order to make it there on time, right? A lot of us have, have rearranged our schedules. A lot of us have done different things to make church life a priority, right? And this is a spectrum, right? People get, people get saved. They start coming to church. They start figuring out what they should be doing. And, hey, it takes a, takes a little bit of time to implement these strategies and get things, get things in gear so that church is a priority in your life and that church isn't an option anymore. 
Um, but what helps, especially as a man, as a leader of the house, is making sure that we are founded on the rock. Luke chapter 6, look down at verse 48. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Sounds like that guy had a, lot of bit of, a good bit of work ahead of him. He built the house, he digged deep, he laid that foundation on the rock. That's a lot of hard work in, in you know, a couple dozen words there. You're digging all the way down to the foundation. That foundation could be pretty deep. You're working hard to build the house. You're working hard to lay all these uh, building codes or processes in order in your Christian life to protect your Christian life from the storms that Satan can throw at you, from the storms that life can throw at you, right? You're building your Christian life on that foundation, on that rock. Who's the rock? The Bible says that rock was Christ. So we need to build our Christian life on the rock, and we also need to uh, build the foundations to pr protect it so that it isn't hindered or tossed around with every wind or storm that comes our way in life or that Satan tries to throw at us. It was founded upon a rock. And notice it says it could not shake it. Another verse in Matthew 7, it says, and it fell not. But in Luke, it says it could not even shake it. That's a powerful thing. That man had structured his life to where it could not be shaken. And I understand, again, life happens, things happen, but we should contingency plan and have backups and options to prevent those things from getting in the way of church. That should be the last resort, right? Um, how can we lead our, our families? How can we lead, as, lead by example in our Christian life for our wife, for our kids, for our future wife, uh, th for those that are single? And, and if we aren't founded upon the rock ourselves, if we aren't plugged into the rock, if we aren't plugged into our Bible, there's a lot of hard work and preparation needed for that, but Matthew 16, 18 gives this promise. It says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, speaking of himself, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If we do this properly, this is the, this is the, the um, sometimes it might be easy to get envious of the liberal Christian, the guy that's saved, that's doing whatever they want to do, that goes to church once in a while, that, you know, seems to have, have the perfect picture in, in their eyes. But we know that those pleasures of sin for a season are only going to lead to sorrow down the road, right? They're going to lead to broken marriages. They're going to lead to children that are going astray, the children that don't even get saved, or children that go completely sideways. Um, the long haul, the Christian, the Christian life isn't measured in years, it's measured in decades, right? And so the pleasures of sin for a season, those don't equate to those promises, like it says here, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, as, again, as, as, uh, as specifically kind of talking about men and, and um, husbands, um, you know, we want to avoid being lukewarm, all of us, we want to avoid being lukewarm in our Christian life. We want to avoid being, we want to protect against becoming lukewarm or having situations that can get us uh, sidetracked from our Christian life. But also, when we're leading others as men or as husbands, uh, but as, even as women, too, as, they lead, the, as lead, they lead the kids in homeschool and the older siblings as they lead with their younger siblings, we want to be able to uh, lead in a way that we protect others from becoming lukewarm or getting sidetracked or getting backslidden as well. Turn to Mark, turn to, um, Mark chapter 10, please. Mark chapter number 10. Pastor had a really good sermon series, uh, sermon a couple weeks ago on, on marriage and on, on husbands and on wives. And um, also we had read through John uh, chapter 13, I believe it was, where Jesus is washes in the feet of the disciples. And it kind of brought to mind Mark 10 uh, and verse 42. It says, But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. It's this idea of servant leadership that Christ modeled completely for us, right? He, did, he came to this earth to do nothing for himself. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have kids. He didn't do anything for himself. He came completely to be the sacrifice for us. Ephesians chapter number 5, if you would turn there, please. Ephesians chapter number 5. And so we, as we talk, as Jesus talked there in Mark, he's talking about the Gentiles, those of the world, those of, in politics, and the kings and the presidents and the governors and all these things, they exercise rule over the people, and the other ones exercise authority over them. 
but among us, among you, he says, it should not be that way. We should be your minister if you want to be great among you. Ephesians 5 kind of teases this out further uh, in verse 25, talking specifically about husbands and wives. And we'll kind of compare and contrast this. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So keeping in mind the idea of servant leadership, making sure that as leaders of the home or as leaders of the marriage or as leaders in our own lives with other people, if we're trying to lead other people, we ought to be serving them, getting all the obstacles out of their way for them to be great, for them to excel, for them to come on board. It talks about in 2 Kings 10 uh, in verse 15, six, well, 16, when uh, Jehu and the man, he, he caught the man on the way, Jonadab, on the way, and he, and he, was, he said, uh, sorry, let me read it for you. And when he, Jehu, was departed thence, he lighted on Jonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him, and saluted him, and said unto him, Is thine heart right as it, my heart is with thine heart? And Jonadab said, answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand. And he took him up into the chariot, and he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. That's how we should be as leaders. The aspect that we have leadership authority in, be it in our marriage, be it in our family, be it uh, older siblings or whatever. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. That's what we ought to lead. We ought to bring people with us and show them the zeal, right? We ought to be, as leaders, we should, be, uh, we should have more Bible knowledge than the people we're leading. We should be more zealous for the things of God than the people we're leading. We should be further along on that journey than the people we're leading. But that doesn't mean we should leave them in the dust, right? Take the burdens off of those people so that they can learn too. Uh, the sermon this morning was kind of geared towards the family integrated church and, I, and that was one thing I was going to touch on a little bit. I've noticed in myself and my family like sometimes the only issue that, that the family integrated church has is sometimes the moms, especially when there's young children, they have to be in the mother baby room while they're nursing or different things and the potential for them, the potential for them to maybe not get as much out of the sermon when you're watching it on a screen is there. I don't know a lot of your stories as far as salvation. I got saved on, through the online ministry, and so I started listening to a lot of these sermons, and you're listening to all these sermons online, Pastor Anderson, Pastor Jimenez, all these different pastors throughout the country. And you're listening to them, and I was reaching that point where I'm just like consuming this knowledge and really diving into it and trying to grow a lot as a Christian. And uh, just fresh saved and learning about all these documentaries and the King James issue and the reprobate doctrine, all these different things. And you're just consuming knowledge and consuming knowledge and then trying to, trying to lead somebody that hasn't consumed as much knowledge, you can't just drag, drag people through the mud. You have to lead them that way. You have to tell them, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And in that same breath, it's interesting because for me especially, uh, listening to all these preachings online and different sermons and hearing these great powerful sermons online, be it YouTube or whatever, um, we finally, we were going to a local church in Atwater and different things, and we decided, you know what, I want to I put my family under, under this type of church. So we decided we're going to drive to Sacramento, we're going to make that drive, and we're going to go to a church service at Verity Baptist. And we go there, and it's interesting, because I've heard Pastor Jimenez preach multiple times just through YouTube or whatever sermon was uh, being preached. And when you hear it live, when you're sitting in the room and you hear it live, it hits different. And the same way, especially with wives that are taking care of the young children in the mother baby room, it hits different when it's coming from a screen than if you're sitting in church service. And that's one, note, one thing that I've noticed and I've tried to be better about myself, and maybe that can be a suggestion to some of you too, like making sure that I try and take my son so that my wife can sit through the search, church service and get that same face-to-face -face, uh, preaching that she needs too. Right? Our kids need it too, and that's the beauty of the family integrated church. But we have to make sure that we're not uh, leaving people in the dust, too, right? Soul winning is another one. I've seen this before, and, and, and sometimes uh, as men, we're zealous for the things of God, and we should be as leaders in our home, and we're zealous to go soul winning and to get started and to learn and to jump both feet in. But as far as trying to encourage the rest of our family, maybe you have older kids or encourage your wife to start soul winning and start being a talker. And it can be tough if you have kids and the wife's constantly having to watch the kids. As the leader, take that burden from your wife. Make sure you're having the kids that's acting up the most or that's causing the most trouble so that she can have time to go out there and get her soul winning in. Or take, take the kids for a while. She goes soul winning by herself. Perfect. 
but make sure as we're leading those around us that we're giving them opportunities to come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Does that make sense? Um, and again, back to the Bible uh, with Ephesians chapter 5. Um, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. It says that we might sanctify and cleanse it, talking about Christ to the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. In our case, Christ's case, it was the church, but in our case, it's our wives. That they might sanctify and cleanse them with the washing of water by the word. We need to make sure that we are uh, leading our families, leading our spouses in a way uh, that we are encouraging them to grow. Come with me and see my zeal, not just leaving them in the dust. Make sure that we are, you know, Attitude reflects leadership, right? So if we're doing a good job as a leader, our, those that are following us should also be doing a good job. They should be competent in their Bible. They should be strong Christians as well. They should be sold out for the things of God as well. And that can be a barometer for us to see how we're doing as leaders. Um, we must show the way. We must lead in a way that does that. Um, in conclusion, um, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So again, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be wishy-washy. We shouldn't be lukewarm in our Christian life. We need to be strong in our Christian life. We need to be on the extremes in the Christian life. Uh, three to thrive, soul winning. Um, God wants us to be. God doesn't want us to get too comfortable in this in this world, right? This world is not our home. We're we're passing on. We're pilgrims in this land. First Corinthians 16. And sometimes there's things that happen, right? The world gets in the way. Things happen. But we ought to be prepared and and uh, organized so that we can push through those things and still make church a priority, still make soul winning a priority, not let our work life get in front of things, not let, oh, my feelings or my, how I feel or if I'm sick or not or if I got a scratch in my throat, not let those things get in the way, not make excuses for us getting backslidden or out of church. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. It's a pretty simple verse. But that's what it takes as we're leading people and, and as we're trying to impact the community in Fresno, right? We need people that are constantly out soul winning. If we're going to reach the 500,000 to a million people that are in Fresno area, you know, we need a lot of soul winners. We need people that are putting in the hours. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't be flippy-floppy. Let's make sure that we can make church a priority. Because at the end of the day, in the same example um, of calling in sick at work, if you miss work or if you miss uh, a job, something doesn't get done. And in that same example, if we don't go soul winning, and we should be going soul winning, if we don't go soul winning, somebody doesn't get the opportunity to hear the gospel that they would have that day. You know, we have the maps, we have it organized so that eventually we're going to reach all of Fresno through a course of time. But every day that we go, we have a certain map, and God sets up those divine appointments. We've all been there. We've all met people that, wow, I was just asking this question, or the guy that just happened to walk down the street that normally goes two streets over, but he just decided this day that he's going to walk this way, and he ends up, you know, sitting in here in the gospel. If we don't go, who's going to go? If we don't go when we're not feeling well, like Brother Ben talked the other night, you know, if we got a headache, well, it's okay to be uncomfortable. I can do what I have to do, you know. God tells me to do what I have to do regardless of how I feel. If we don't do it, if we're not in our community doing this, who will? Let's go ahead and close in prayer.